The promises of God, very clearly one of the most important subjects of the Word of God. There are more than 7,000 precise, precious promises in the Bible. These were made by God to man. In today's teaching time with Dr. Lester Sumrall, we will be looking at the many facets of these glittering diamonds of truth. Some are startling, others breathtaking. Now, here is Dr. Lester Sumrall. It is a great joy to speak forth words of eternal life and to teach those things that create within us anointing and blessing and assurance. And all the people said, Amen. we have been studying the promises of God. Huh. I have been so excited about the promises of God. I just hope that in uh, giving you the promises of the Lord, they haven't just seemed like, you know, more words, but they're realities, they're powers, they're anointings. Really, they're a blank check. Just make out anything you want to and receive it. Today's lesson, relative to the promises of God, God's promises related to everlasting life. Now, we've been going for quite a while, if you're a visitor here today, this is lesson number 17, just dealing with the promises of God. And in this lesson, the promises of God are related to everlasting life. It's a very beautiful lesson in that the deepest desire of every human person is to experience everlasting life. There is no desire above that desire in a human person. All humans want to live continuously forever and ever. They want to live perpetually, no ending to the life they live on the face of this earth. They want to live happily during that time. Yet, we must all admit, on this earth, man is denied the fullness of these desires. He wants to live forever and then he dies. As we study the Word of God, and as we study uh, the, the history of, of human beings, Every man and every woman has an appointment with death, not with life, with death. Hebrews 9, 27 says, it is appointed unto men once to die. That takes care of the problem of continual rebirth. When the devil and his lying wonders say that you die and you come back here again for another chance. How many believe God's word is true? There is no reincarnation. Man has an appointment unto, to die. After that, the judgment. There is no rebirth. He is judged by this life in which he lives today. Human life is divinely limited to an average of three score and ten years. That's 60 plus 10, 70. We read in the Psalms, Psalm 90 and verse 10, the days of our years are three score and ten and if by reason of strength they be four score years yet is their strength labor and sorrow older people know that for it is soon cut off and we fly away man begins tremendous and sometimes original endeavors to build and to make something on the face of this earth and then he cannot complete that which he has started because of the succession of time that he has on this earth. Man gets sick unto death and leaves the activities that he has started. But Christians, say Christians, nobody else, but Christians are promised the greatest desire of humans, eternal life. Our text is in Romans 6, verses 22 and 23. But now being made free from sin. How many glad you're free? Free from sin. And become servants of God. We were servants of the devil and of sin. You have your fruit unto holiness. Bless God. 
The devil better know that. Our fruit is unto holiness. And the end is everlasting life. When you live a good, clean, pure, holy life, you're going to live forever. 23 says, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is a gift. We are going to live forever. You say, Brother Summerall, what is eternal life? Eternal life is life without a terminal point of any kind. It is perpetual health with no sickness or no death related to it. Just living forever. Everybody wants to say amen. amen. Now everlasting life is an inheritance. The word of God tells us in Matthew 19, verse 29, these words, And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, father, or mother, wife, children, lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold. Say hundredfold. Well, go ahead and get yours. Don't mess around with ten if you can get a hundred. Shall, in, shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. So everlasting life is an inheritance. It's an inheritance to those who have forsaken. You say that means you go off and leave them? No, it doesn't. It means they're not your gods. The God Almighty is the only God we have and we serve him. Peter said in 1 Peter 1 and 3 these words, Blessed be the God of our Father and of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ of the dead to an inheritance, an inheritance, incorruptible. It's that everlasting life. And undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved. <laughs> Glory be to God. You've got a reservation. Reserved in heaven for you. So everlasting life is an inheritance. It is also a reward. In Romans 6, 22, it says, Being now made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness at the end everlasting life. And so when you are made free from sin and you become servants of the living God, and you have the fruit of holiness in your lives, the end of that thing is eternal life. So eternal life is a reward to those that love and serve God. How many are ready for the rewards? How many looking forward to living forever? Really, are you? <laughs> Everlasting life is also a kingdom. In 2 Peter 1 11, it says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Everlasting life is a kingdom, it says. Into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Revelation 5 and 10, it says, And hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So everlasting life is an only existing it is also ruling, you know. It is a kingdom. How many are glad for that? What is the door that you can enter into for this everlasting life? We read in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, these words, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We're not going to all die. When the rapture comes, the rest of us are going to go up in a hurry. Can you say Amen. However, he says, we shall all be changed. Those that are alive and those that are dead. He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you know how quick a twinkle of an eye is? That's how quick we're going to leave here one day. If you're ready for it, say amen. amen. For the trumpet shall sound, the trumpet of God, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Isn't that amazing? When they come forth, they'll never be like they were before. They shall be raised incorruptible. And then we that remain on the earth at that time, we shall be changed. That means this, this 
mortal body will immediately be, ch be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must, must put on immortality, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on this incorruption. So when this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is already written, death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, it says, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. This is your door. Unmovable. Better say unmovable. Brother, I want you to tell you now, all the things that can be moved are going to get moved. The devil's going to see to that. You want to be founded on the rock. Unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, that's your, 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 that's, that's your hope of success. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. May I say that again? <laughs> always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's the way you're unmovable and that's the way you're steadfast. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain, it's not empty if it's in the Lord. This is the door into everlasting life, that we're gonna move from this corruption to incorruption. We're gonna move from this mortal into that immortality, and in that immortality we shall live forever and ever and ever and ever. And all the people said, let it be, glory be to God. You say, Brother Summerall, there's so many things I want to know about this. I know you do. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse nine, it, it, it tells you about it. It says, now today we know in part, this is 1 Corinthians 13, 9, knowledge and everlasting life. At the present, we know in part, and we prophesy in part. And a lot of us are willing to accept the know in part, but not the prophesy in part. When you hear prophecies in the church, I, I want to tell you, they're just so limited about that big. You, you think God's giving you the, all the knowledge of the next world. No, he's giving you a little bit of it, about, little, about that big. Now we know in part and we prophesy in part. We don't have it all yet. But when that is perfect, it's come. Then that which is in part shall be done away. That's at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, now listen, when I was a child, I speak as a child, understood as a child, I thought as a child, and we're just the children of God right now. But when I became a man, I put away my childish things. For now, in this present life, we see through a glass darkly, but then in our resurrected life, we shall see his face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. One person won't know it. We're all going to know it. One person's not going to have all the knowledge. We're all going to have all the knowledge. And so knowledge and everlasting life flow together. And what we don't know now, we will know. There's so many people that says, I wish I knew this. I wish I knew that. I wish I knew why my loved one passed away. I wish, you know, so many things we want to know. The time will come when you will know. You will know. We shall all know. But until that time, he wants us to be faithful. Until that time, he wants us to believe. If you know it, say amen. Everlasting life, the grand fulfillment of rest for the immortal soul, for the believer. Everlasting life is going to bring us into that rest that we've desired since we were children. We seek for that rest. Revelation 7, 17 says, For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them into living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And that life beyond, in that everlasting life, the Lamb will be very close to us. And He will feed us the Word of God says. And He will lead us, the Word of God says, right through the fountains of living waters. And if there be a tear of any kind, of any sort, God Himself will just wipe it away and it will be gone. This everlasting life is the grand fulfillment of the rest for the human personality that we desire. Also in that same book, chapter 14 and verse 13, it says, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works to follow them. 
when we enter into this abundant and everlasting life, we will rest from our labors. Some of us have a lot of them, too much of them. At that point, eternal life and everlasting life is greatly related to the fulfillment of the rest desired for the people of God. In Hebrews 4 and 9, it says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. And we're looking forward to it, and we're going to have it. And if you know it, say amen. We're going to have it, and we want to thank God for it. In the Word of God, we, we, we are not left in the dark when it comes to where we're going to be tomorrow. What is life like past this life? If you're past 40 or 50, you're beginning to do some thinking about where am I going to spend eternity? What's it going to be like over there? The Bible is not limited in just this life. The Word of God teaches you what you're going to be forever and ever. And the hope that you can have within you of living with Him forever and ever. That beyond this world that has its briars and has its stubble and, and has its tinseled deceivings, that beyond this life there is the real life, the glorious life, the wonderful life, and it's in God. And that we have rest in that life. And all the people said, let it be. You say, who is the dispenser of this everlasting life that we can enter into? In 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1 and verse 10, it reads like this. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death. That's your everlasting life for you and has brought life and immortality. <laughs> Did you know we had known nothing about life beyond this world if it wasn't for Jesus? He is the one that brought light into a world of superstition and a world of lies and a world of ignorance. He brought light and also he brought immortality, this eternal life, this everlasting life that we're talking about. Christ is the one who revealed it Christ is the one who brought it. Christ is the one who gives it. And he is the very core and center of the eternal life that you and I are part of today. I'm glad to be part of Jesus, aren't you? And that has to do with this everlasting life. He has brought it. It says brought life and immortality to the light. How? Those last three words. Through the gospel. Through the gospel. Through the preaching of the gospel. Through the reading of the gospel. There is no other way. Sears Roebuck catalog might sell you a lot of gadgets. One thing they don't deal in, and that's eternal life. You can go to these supermarkets and plunder around through them all you want to. They may deal in a lot of things, but they don't deal in eternal life. They can have a lot of bargains for this season of the year, but they don't bargain eternal life. Only the Lord Jesus Christ is the dispenser of eternal life. That he is the one that brought it to the world. He is the life and immortality that we have today. And he's the one that brought it to light. Nobody else had it. All the great philosophers dreamed of something. They couldn't put their finger on it. Christ revealed it. You and I have it. It's ours forever. Aren't you glad for it right now? The word of God says in 1 Timothy 5, and it, excuse me, in 1 Timothy 6, verse 16, these words. Who only hath immortality. That's Jesus dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. The Lord Jesus possesses the immortality. He's dwelling in the light which no man can approach, which is the throne of God. And he is the one that introduces us to immortality. And he is the one that gives unto us the everlasting life that we crave for. That's made very simple in John three sixteen. Whereas, and Jehovah loved the entire world and that he gave to this world his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should never perish. That simply means to cease to exist. But that he should have this thing that we call ever living and everlasting life. It's a terrible thing to start something beautiful and you're gone before you finished it. I, I was brought abruptly to this thing many years ago, the day that it was announced that Will Rogers and Wiley Post uh, had died. Just this week, I preached in the big hangar 
that was Wiley Post's personal hangar where he kept his, his flight gear in his airplanes. And it's a church now. That's a good conversion, isn't it? It's a church now. But after, after uh, they died, the newspapers revealed that Will Rogers had so many film contracts. He had so many business deals. He was just loaded with unfinished business. In this everlasting life, there is no unfinished business. We live and we live and we live. A man builds a building and just before he dedicates it, he dies. He never enjoys it. In Oklahoma City, where I ministered this week, two people, a man and his wife, who had just gone into the 80s, 80 some odd years old, very wealthy people, they were just thinking of leaving Oklahoma City and going down into the hills of Arkansas where they had built a home, the paper said, that cost over a half million dollars. Neighbors saw them walking in the street at 10.30 in the morning. But by one o'clock, somebody had killed them in their homes. Magnificent home. Unfinished business. Life terminated and all gone. The ones that, that, that killed them stole one of their cars and they found it in a parking lot a couple of hours later. No clues. If they don't know Jesus, that's the end of living as far as they're concerned. But if they did know Jesus, that was the beginning of the eternal life. <laughs> you can do whatever you want to with this mortal body. Brother, we're going to live forever. We may have a few little projects uncompleted down here. We got some mighty projects going over there that are going to go on forever. We're going to stay right with them. Everlasting life belongs to those who hear and those who believe. Listen carefully to it. John 5, 24. He that heareth my word, Jesus said, and believeth on him that sent me half everlasting life. That's how simple it is. All the promises related to everlasting life have their footings and foundation on two things. Hearing. It's too bad millions haven't heard yet. There's only one people responsible for it and that's the church. I am so concerned that Many Christians bear no burden, bear no burden at all. Yesterday we met a, an entire family of people in this city that I had known for a number of years. And after they left from where we were, I spoke to those that were with me. And I said, see that whole family we just spoke to there? I says, I doubt that anyone in that whole family have ever won one person to the Lord. They all claim to be Christians. I says, I seriously doubt, I seriously doubt that anyone in that whole family, you saw them from grandma down to the new baby, I seriously doubt that they have ever won one person to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, neighbors, a lot of things you can do, and they're temporary. There are other things you can do, and they're forever. And they're related, they are related to everlasting life. And the two things that relate you to, the, to everlasting life is hearing the word, hearing the word. Brother, you better give your attention to hearing the word of God. In the word of God, there's everlasting life. That other bunch of junk you spend your time with, you know, I am so thankful to God, I have never messed up my life with novels. You know, I don't even, I don't even read religious novels. You know what I say? If it's a lie, it's a lie. It don't matter whose name you associate with it. And I don't, I, I just don't read junk. You can just fabricate the finest novel in the world and ask me to read it. And, and I'll tell you right now, I'm too busy reading truth. I'm too busy studying people. You're alive. I'd rather, I'd rather read a biography of what God did in your life than any novel any fool ever wrote. Excuse me for putting a capital F in front of it. He that heareth my word, he that believeth, on him that sent me. He has each everlasting life. It's simple, isn't it? You got to get a hold of that. 
Some of us think by accident, some people get it and some don't. That is not true. You've got to hear it, you've got to believe it, and you got it. <laughs> I'm really glad for that. Everlasting life also is related to a harvest time of sowing and reaping. Look in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh, that's the bad kind of seed, shall all the flesh reap corruption, that's death. But he that soweth to the Spirit, hmm, that's living the right kind of life. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Every one of these texts was good for an hour, weren't they? And so this everlasting life is related to what you're sowing right today and tomorrow and next day. And you know, we're not fooling anybody but ourselves. So many of us, you know, I get so tickled sometimes. I go to a house and they say, oh, you can't see me like this. Well, honey, Jesus already saw you. That's more important than me seeing you. Oh, I wouldn't want Brother Sumner to hear this for anything. Well, honey, God already heard it. He's more important than I am. You're not keeping any secrets from him. And this is a life of sowing and reaping of eternal life, eternal life. If you sow in carnality, you'll die. If you sow in spirituality, everlasting life. Whew. I want to get into it, don't you? I've shown you the way, and these are the promises in the Bible related to everlasting life that God wants us to walk in. He wants you to sow spiritual seed every day. We can if we keep it in mind. You believe that? So let us sow those spiritual seed. Let us walk in strength and power right straight into the arms of Jesus and live with him forever and ever. If you're going to do it, say amen. We're going to do it in Jesus' name. God bless you. May his word not be a temporary thing, but may it find a, a deep place within us to bring forth a harvest, a harvest of immortality, a harvest of everlasting life. Glory. You know, I am now reaping the whole harvest in my natural man of the last 50 years. I'm reaping it today. And it's good. Man, it's so good. I can't tell you how good it is. You see? Thank you, Father, that we believe the promises of God and they're getting better all the time. So bless them to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's lesson is from the Promises of God teaching series. We hope that you will apply the Word of God discussed in today's program to your own life. An audio cassette of today's lesson is available upon request. To order, send a donation of $5 or more to Lacey, P.O. Box 12, South Bend, Indiana, 46624. Please mention the program number on your screen when ordering. This program has been made possible by private contributions to Lacey. This has been a LaCie Broadcasting Network production.